call a meeting for um, it's our first meeting of 2023 of the CJCC. Um, I want to go through the call of the role. Do that one sec. Uh, Katie, do we have it recorded? Yep, I just press record. Okay, We're good. excellent. Um, I can go over, I can do roll call if you'd like. Sure. All right. Um, we present, we have uh, our new 2023 chair, uh, Andrea Nodoff. We've got our 2000, uh, 2000, 2023 vice chair, uh, Judge Christina Meyer. Um, on Zoom, we've got Supervisor Kelly McAuliffe uh, from Hawaii. <laughs> um, we've got Supervisor uh, Kyle Reese on, um, on Zoom as well. We've got Judge Peterson in the room. Um, we've got Director, uh, DHS Director Paula Winter is uh, on Zoom. Um, we've got Sheriff Big in the room. Um, we've got Clerk of Court Katie Shalley in the room. We've got DOC Supervisor Michelle Barrow on Zoom. Um, we've got uh, Assistant Public Defender Jonathan Lundeen on One Zoom. Moment. We have uh, UW Stout Chief Jason Spetz on Zoom. Uh, we have um, Citizen Member uh, Jamie Dardane, who is the legal advocate with the Bridge to Hope. Uh, she is here in the room. We've got Child Support Director Josie La Liberty on Zoom. Uh, and we have uh, Public Health Director Katie Gallagher in the room. Um, and myself, and then we have our presenter, Shelly Jo Metzger uh, from the jail. I think I've got everybody, and uh, we'll just take note of whoever joins us. Um, I think Sarah sent out in the packet the minutes from the last meeting, which I think was October 13th of 2022. Does anyone uh, want to make a motion regarding those minutes? We move to accept. Any discussion? Okay. Uh, hearing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes from October 13th of 2022 signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, looks like those are approved. Is there any public comment? No, there's not. Um, so as far as welcome remarks, I guess um, I would say our county manager, um, Chris Corporal, has sent out uh, a book to all of the um, department heads that she wanted us to read and do a strengths finder to talk about um, what our top five skills are, are. And so I thought I would share them because, um, you know, for me, the first one is Achiever. And when I read through the, uh, oh, here's Chris. When I read through the description of Achiever from that strengths finder book, um, so it kind of very much echoed that meetings are hard for me. I am a person that likes to get something done. And when I sit here for an hour, I feel like I'm not getting anything done. So um, I, I think that our uh, this meeting today is try to set forward um, our goals moving forward. But my hope is that if we're going to have a meeting that we are going to have goals to accomplish and we're going to work towards those. Um, uh, so I'm very much into having a timeline. If we're going to set a goal, let's um, keep it moving. So. Um, that's just part of my personality and that strength finder really um, kind of echoed that. My next uh, personality, of course, according to that, was the includer. And I really think that's kind of the strength of the CJCC is um, getting us all together. We're all involved in the same, um, you know, kind of the same goal to make our community safer. And um, when everyone has a voice, I think it... Um, makes us all better and uh, the CJCC as many meetings as I've gone to um, through my time in Dunn County and as at times to be frank annoyed I've been by having to sit here because I'm not getting something done. It's been very beneficial in that we are able to get grants, we're able to move forward, we're able to create initiatives and new positions and, and so it really does, um, it's worthwhile and so I encourage you to be at every meeting that you can. Um, also I'd like everyone to speak, you know, I, a lot of Katie, the judges and myself, we're, we see each other like every day. Um, and it seems like we do a lot of the talking and I'd love to see more talking from more members, um, as well as our citizen members. Um, 
this year and possible. And then, um, yeah, so those are my welcome remarks. I appreciate um, Chris Corpola for all the work she's done. I think she's already, we had, if you think we have a lot of meetings now, you should have seen them years ago. We had lots and lots of meetings. So um, Chris has really uh, focused that down. And um, I think historically it's shown that Dunn County needs more meetings and we need a, a grant or, data to get that grant we're able to get it done and we all know how to get together real quick and and crank out these uh, grants so um appreciate chris and all of the the work she's done um, yeah so moving on to six um consideration for actions to be taken by the council i think at our last executive meeting we went through proposed goals all right it's correct i'm gonna share my screen <laughs> you want me to take? Sure. Oh, okay. Um, so just to um, get everybody on the same page, um, we had an executive meeting back in early December and talked about 2023 goals and activities. Um, and we were able to um, this was um, in the tail end of Chris Corpola's um, leadership as chair, really help us focus on um, a few goals that are realistic and accomplishable um, that we can focus on in 2023. So this is what was recommended um, to really fully implement the medication assisted treatment program in jail. So that was a grant that we received in 2022. Um, it was not part of our goals for 2020. Uh, to necessarily to seek out that opportunity, but it was something that presented itself. So we want to uh, focus this year on really implementing that on, on solid footing. We're going to hear in a little bit later um, from Shelly Jo Metzger, the, the substance abuse counselor in jail, more in detail about that program and the status. Um, number two goal was to fully implement the law enforcement deflection and diversion initiatives. Um, so back in 2022, we did have a goal to collaborate with the city of Menominee um, on their uh, grant to do law enforcement deflection and diversion. And again, there was another grant opportunity that came up quickly in 22, and we were able to um, secure funding uh, with, uh, uh, for the sheriff's office. Um, to also look at that deflection and diversion. So we want to fully implement that program in 2022 or 2023. Um, and, and that's in, the, in progress um, as we speak. Um, number three is to expand and enhance the treatment opportunity program. So we did receive a um, slightly larger grant for 2023 uh, TAD grant. Um, so this is really allowing us instead of having a um, part-time uh, coordinator for the treatment opportunity program. We're going to have a full-time dedicated uh, program coordinator for that. Um, that's Janae Schlesser, as, as most of you are aware. Um, so previously she was doing treatment court and treatment opportunity. Um, and as the treatment opportunity program um, has grown and as we've seen the outcomes, um, it really warrants um, a, a full um, staff. So with that, there's a, a little bit extra funding um, for supportive um, needs for participants, but really looking at expanding the capacity. So instead of serving 30 uh, per year, we're, we're looking at serving 60 individuals per year. Um, so that um, is just a nice opportunity for us to get the funding to uh, really deliver the, uh, the program that uh, our community is looking for. Um, and then number four is to continue to focus on that professional development and education. That was something that we, um, that again, under Chris Corpola, that we really um, woven into our CJCC meetings, our quarterlies, trying to have an education component. We're going to carry that over, um, recommending and carry that over to 2023 um, and provide other opportunities for uh, professional development. So those are the proposed goals that were um, discussed and approved at the executive level. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Andrea for discussion. So knowing that those are um, four goals moving forward and you know, more opportunities come up or goals may change, um, 
I think that we need a motion and vote on this. Is that right? Yes. Is there anyone that would like to make a motion um, related to the goals for 2023? I would make a motion that we accept those goals uh, for 2023. I'll second. Any discussion about those goals? Hearing none, um, all those in favor of approving the 2023 CJCC goals, uh, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. Next is our uh, committees and teams for next for this year. All right. Um, so as far as um, proposed changes um, to committees and teams and chairs, so um, through our bylaws, we have, we've got our council meeting and we um, have been meeting quarterly. Um, we're recommending that we really continue that structure um, with the executive committee that's in our bylaws that is uh, prescribed as far as the membership. Um, we're gonna continue, proposing to continue that in uh, 2023. Um, and then the operations committee. So that was a special committee that we started up um, a few years ago at this point, um, we're really uh, wanting to continue that. So that is that monthly group that really has their pulse and their oversight um, of the different groups and initiatives. And this uh, also allows us to respond quickly to some of those grant opportunities that come up. Um, the operations committee is essentially the executive group with some other uh, uh, stakeholders in the criminal justice system. Uh, but I would uh, just make it known to the full council that anyone and everyone on the council is welcome to join in on the operations committee um, in those uh, meetings. Um, when we're looking at the teams, that's when we're really looking um, to, to make some shifts in 2023. Um, so we've had some um, kind of informal teams that were focused on drug endangered children, uh, data, and we had the CASA grant team that um, was focused on Menominee um, PD and really collaborating. So we're, um, through our executive meeting and the recommendations, we're looking to really move the monitoring and oversight from those teams to the over, um, operations committee. So really that monthly um, connection there um, and really have the teams meet as needed um, or if necessary. So at this point, the CASIP grant team is um, as you can see, the uh, mission statement there, the purpose statement, um, we've kind of outgrown that. Um, so the, the recommendation there is to essentially kind of end the CASAP team, but move those responsibilities in coordinating, collaborating with the two CASAP grants to the oversight uh, or the operations committee for that oversight. Um, for the data team, we've had uh, clerk of court, Katie Shally, um, kind of shepherding is what we're kind of switching terms a little bit. So rather than chairing a formal group, really continuing to um, spearhead those efforts and convene meetings of, um, of individuals as needed. Um, the data team is an example that we already have the data flowing on a monthly basis. Um, we can um, really, um, you know, we've got all the, the, the flow in, in, in process. It's when we need to have a meeting, we would have a meeting. Um, versus continue to have meetings every month just to have a meeting. Um, same with the drug endangered children team. So um, that group has also essentially um, fulfilled a lot of their purpose as far as establishing the relationships, getting a memorandum of understanding. Uh, we wanna see that that continues, but it doesn't necessarily warrant a, a work group or a formal team. Um, so the recommendation here is to have um, Human Services Director Paula Winter as the shepherd of our Drug Endangered Children Initiative, um, where she can continue to monitor that those, um, those efforts are ongoing. Um, she would be able to report to our operations committee um, as often as needed, maybe once a year or twice a year, as often as we'd like. Um, and then she would able, also able to convene that group if there's ever a need to, um, to do so. Um, so really looking at continuing maybe that, the more, the less formality of the teams. They, these used to be work groups, so they went down to teams, and now we're really looking for them to be more shepherds um, that would be part of our operations group, and we can convene those, those teams as, as needed. Um, one team that we're looking to continue would be the effective methamphetamine strategies. 
um, that was co-chaired by um, Chris Corpola and Chief Atkinson. Um, and there's interest in continuing that in 2023. Um, and that makes sense when you think about the impact of methamphetamines on the work that we do and the people that we work with. Um, it is definitely a, a major factor that we, we need to continue to um, develop those effective strategies for. So those are some of the proposed changes um, to the committees and teams, and I'll turn it over to Andrea for discussion. So my understanding is instead of, you know, it used to be back in the day, we would have, you know, monthly meetings for drug and nature children or monthly data team, you know, uh, meetings now they've been reduced. Doesn't mean that they're going away. Um, drug and major children team is still going to work uh, with law enforcement and human services, the data team. Katie, you're not off the hook. You continue to yep. yeah. gather data whenever we have these annuals and anytime there's a grant. Um, Katie's an achiever. <laughs> and the uh, cost of grants, I mean, those are, those, you have to report for those all the time too, right? Every year at least. Um, so just to know they're not going away, we're just not going to have a structured monthly meeting. So, um, and then, uh, so I think we're for the any motion to um, approve the 2023 CJCC committees and teams. So moved. Second. Any discussion regarding those? Can you go back to who's on the executive committee to that slide? Okay. Which is set by bylaw, right? Yep. The, the composition of the executive is set yep. by the I just, I just wanted to go back to make sure I knew who was on it. Okay, thank you. So any discussion or any further discussion regarding the committees or teams or? All those in favor of approving the uh, proposed 2023 CJCC committees and teams uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, those are passed. Um, now we're to the 2023 chairs of those committees and teams. Andrea, could I just come on to make a comment about that in terms of this group? Not the chairs, but the action that we just took to approve those. You know, I think that coming off of being the chair um, and then, you know, handing the baton to um, Andrea and thinking about, like, one of the things that you never know is, are you hitting the mark? Or you, I shouldn't say you never know, but you wonder, are we hitting the mark? Are we hitting the mark as a group? And so as we've worked to try to make the functions as, equip, as uh, efficient as possible for the CJCC. And we've revisited, you know, does the operations um, committee accomplish what we'd like it to come? But I think it might be um, beneficial for there just to be sort of an occasional testing of the waters here to just say, are we, you know, are, are we are we doing enough? Are we meeting off? And I mean, nobody's gonna say I want more meetings. I get that. But I mean, our, because I think one of the things we've talked about a lot is, there are times when the CJCC has had a ton of things on its plate, like right now, getting new initiatives off the ground. And then there's times when that ebbs and then it's like, okay, we, we need to pick it up and do some stuff. But I really would say it'd be really helpful to do sort of do a test, a, some touches with this group to just say, all right, everybody feeling like the CJCC is relevant and working and doing what it's supposed to be doing or do we need to circle back and do something different? Yeah. Um, as far as chairs, um, with the streamlined process, um, we of course we've got a new CJCC chair and vice chair. They would be chair of the full council. They'd be chair of the executive um, committee, um, and then they'd also be chair of the operations um, committee. Uh, when we're looking at uh, those team leads or the shepherds. <laughs> We've got um, Katie Shally continuing on with data. Paula Winters willing to take on the drug endangered children. 
Um, and then we also have Chris Corpola and Chief Atkinson willing to um, continue with effective methamphetamine strategies. So those are the proposed leadership for 2023. Unless we have any other takers who really <laughs> would like this job to speak up. <laughs> Michelle, I saw you pop up. Does this mean you you want to join, uh, take a, take over a team? No, sorry. I'm just telling one of my team over here that I'm in a meeting. <laughs> okay. um, so can I make, have a motion to approve the 2023 chairs and uh, committees and team of leaders? So moved as presented. Now I second. Two are on a roll today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any discussion? All those in favor of approving the proposed uh, chairs and uh, team leaders signify by stating aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Um, and then 2023 meeting dates. All right. So I neglected to send out um, the proposed meeting dates in the packet. So I will send that out um, after we have decided. <laughs> um, but really recommending that we. Um, continue with our kind of maintain our current schedule. So this um, group meets quarterly um, on the second Thursday of the month, um, January, April, July, and October at four o'clock. Um, really, we focus for a number of years to keep it to one hour. And I think we've been pretty successful at that, especially when we're talking about overtime <laughs> in the late afternoon and, and really having people stay late. So. Uh, looking at continuing that, um, and as far as the committees, looking at um, continuing that first Wednesday of the month at 11 o'clock, um, we made that shift last year to get off the lunch hours to really, um, and I think it's been a, a nice change. It allows people to have that break during the day, um, and that, you know, it doesn't feel like we're grinding as, as much as um, we have in past years. Um, so really looking to continue that. Um, the operations um, committee would meet monthly and we would have um, a joint meeting with the executive as needed. Um, the executive has um, lesser responsibilities, but certainly important responsibilities. Um, so really looking to you know, not have the teams um, convene in a formal manner unless we need, um, and then not having the executive um, committee meet unless there's really actionable um, work or um, to, to try to front load that. One of the responsibilities is to, um, you know, plan and prepare for the CJCC meeting. If we can do that the month prior and versus having two meetings um, within two weeks, I think that would be um, a, a good move. So that's the recommendation. Um, I do have a list of all the dates. Um, the dates do work with um, certainly the judges and um, Chair Nodoff. Um, but it really is the same pattern that we've been using. So hopefully it works for others as well. Do you want a motion on that, Sarah? Um, whatever you guys feel comfortable. I, I don't know if we need it. Um, I don't think so. Okay. Can I, I think a couple of suggestions that we, when you've done some, we've done some education stuff with this group. I know that you guys are working for the deaf group on your public promotion. Oh. No, sorry for fun, the treatment court on your pu public promotion. Our uh, treatment court and family treatment court roadshow. Yeah, yes. I think that it would be interesting to hear the family and drug treatment court um, roadshow would be one idea. And then the second thing is that I see it's getting a fair amount of press. Again, the whole area of pretrial, um, you know, bonds, all that sort of stuff. I, uh, I've said previously, like, I know literally so little about that. Is there someone that we could call on that could speak to that and or call upon our judges or our prosecutor or whoever to, I mean, I don't want to make work for people, so um, extra work for people, but there's somebody who knows or is there a video, is there something we can watch that could fill in the, those of us who don't live in that world? Um, Great idea. Uh, to just understand more about what some of the controversy or are you talking the no cash bail stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just kind of and it just kind of seems like it pops up in the news all over now, kind of. And the pending constitutional amendments in yep. Wisconsin. Yep. 
how, how technical how technical you want to get <laughs> well how much, how, how for the lay you know i think for the lay person's understanding of what's at stake um i remember one time when sarah and i were at i don't know somewhere in um uh and there were some people from um what do they call them in um louisiana parishes so like whatever wherever um new orleans is in whatever parish it's in um and they were talking about how you know they had people sitting for i mean literally on minor minor offenses they had them sitting for weeks and weeks and weeks because they either you know couldn't pay that a small cash bond or whatever bail bond whatever it's called they couldn't get out or they didn't have prosecute they didn't have prosecutor capacity anyway there were all these issues and they just i mean they had all this jail overcrowding and i don't know it all kind of wove together so but if that's about you've now exhausted what i know about it judge peterson like loves this topic <laughs> yes like well, he lives prep time would be just a nightmare <laughs> <laughs> Put a limit, limit on that one. Yeah, yeah, give me a time limit. Yeah, we'll put a like list, of, list of what you want to know. Right? <laughs> um, so, but I, I'd be happy to do that. I think generally how it works and what the contra or what the kind of controversy are, but you know, like it is controversial. Well, okay, but what controversial? I thought you were going to say constitutional. No, controversial. Okay, yeah. You know, why is it that, why is it now, it's really becoming partisan more partisan than I think it was. And and why is, what is that, that's sort of driving that? Everything's partisan. Well, everything is partisan. And I know in Wisconsin, the um, Waukesha parade incident really ignited that whole debate. Well, it's, it is kind of a fascinating topic and it's, and it is you know, widely misunderstood you know, by the public, you know, and so enlighten us well sometime yeah we are the public mm -hmm. yeah but it is uh we went to a conference in what year was that 2018 uh wow. in yeah. fort worth texas national pretrial services association i heard more about bail and bond that week than i had you know my entire life before that i think but we you know we have you know, we have our state, and there's, every state is different. And uh, I think it's probably would be, you know, valuable to talk about what goes on in our state, maybe a little bit about what some other states do. But it is, uh, it goes all the way back to 1500s. Okay, well, let's not start there. <laughs> okay, so where, where do you want to start? <laughs> start at least by 1650 at the, the latest. Sure. So if I, I can, um, I would just add that I'm going to be sending out some important training dates for 2023. Um, Judge Peterson just mentioned the pretrial conference. That's on here. Treatment court conferences are on here. Some of the police diversion um, conferences are on here. We've got funding, grant funding for small teams to attend. Um, so if there is an interest in learning more, if somebody would like to go, I don't think it's... A, in Fort Worth this year, I don't know where. Well, I've got it right here. Where it is? So, I'm getting old. Yeah, Make glasses for that, Sarah. You want me to hold it over here? Yeah. Right. <laughs> New Orleans. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So, um, but the point is that you know we have opportunities um, for some top-notch education, professional education. Um, and opportunities to send a small team to, to really go and learn and, and soak it in um, so we can really try to practice those um, best practices here. So that'll be coming out um, in, with along with the um, meeting date list. But I, to Chris's point, I would say if anyone has suggestions on education, I'm more than welcome to take those um, and I can discuss it with Andrea and um, Judge Meyer and we can get it on the, the CJCC calendar. That's a good one. Thank you, Chris. Hey, uh, next is what the opioid settlement update. Is that Paula doing that? Yes, Paula had good reception. She was willing to give us an yeah. update. Yeah, so I wasn't sure if I was going to be back from Wisconsin Rapids, but I did just get back and I apologize for the dog. She thinks that um, that I'm home now and it's it's time to snuggle versus um, 
being at work. So otherwise she's going to bark. So I apologize for that. Um, so what I learned today in Wisconsin Rapids with the um, Wisconsin Counties Association um, Summit on the opiate settlement um, was that, um, you know, they are now looking at the pharmacy settlement. They did receive over $50 billion for that settlement. And um, Wisconsin gets 1.76% share of that over $50 billion. And then the counties will get it the exact same way we got the last settlement um, with the money coming, except for um, that they're not able to really um, drill that down quite yet because it's coming at different rates. The, the time limits are much shorter. So we've got like six years, 13 years, 10 years, six years, and 15 years um, with all of the drug companies. And so it's going to be accelerated because of that shortened time frame. So it might look like more money coming, but they're, it's not as long of a period that we will be receiving that funding. Um, so they're working on trying to get those formulas in place. Again, the state will take 30%. Counties will take Take 70 based on who's all um, participating in the settlement. Um, and the other news that they shared was that by the end of March, counties have to um, have a resolution if they are going to take the money in the um, settlement um, piece where you're getting it sooner. You know, it's not lasting as long, but you're not getting as much. So we do have to do that by the end of March if Dunn County is wanting to move in that direction. And um, Andy Phillips, the attorney that we work with, um, will get us within the next week to two weeks max um, a template for that if we wish to go forward with that. So um, have that on the horizon. If we miss that opportunity, you can't go backwards to do that after that date. Um, then um, the other thing I wanted to make sure to tell you is there's a report that's due May 1st annually, um, and they're working on a template for that as well to provide for counties. So knowing that, know that that's coming out as well. Um, let's see. Um, we had a presentation on the overdose fatality. Fatality reviews, um, a presentation and panel from counties that were doing that. And I know that's something that we're looking at here. So I took down lots of notes to be able to share with that team on that. Um, they talked a little bit about the waves, the three ways, waves of um, opiate um, abuse. First was prescription, then was heroin. And we're certainly in that um, fentanyl and synthetic opiates. And, and that hasn't changed over the last couple of years. That continues to be a pattern um, that we're seeing. So there's not a new wave yet as far as the use of drugs and what drugs, um, you know, are using, are um, looking at for this, this funding. Um, let's see. I think there was just a couple other things I wanted to share from today. Um, you know, lots of examples of how people are using it. You know, most counties don't have that down yet. They're still working on it. Um, they're trying to come up with some definitions for us because there's some writing in the um, documentations that's saying if you have a dual diagnosis that it could be used for both. So if you, let's say you have an opioid and mental health disorder, you may be able to use this money for the mental health disorder part of that as well. Um, so that's, you know, they're trying to figure it out. Is that really true or not in that language? Because it's not real clear. So that's something that hopefully we'll get informed more information on and that would be useful because we know that co-occurring um, dis disorders are certainly prevalent and that would be a nice way to use some of that funding as well for that mental health the trauma all of those kinds of things with that um let's see here um oh so they're in progress right now the state we had a presenter from dhs on the State Department of Health Services. They're in progress right now with doing a Narcon Direct grant for law enforcement for 750,000. If law enforcement is interested in getting more Narcan, um, the fentanyl test strips is 300,000 and DPI is 250,000. And then the next thing that they're looking at is, um, 750,000 for after school um, prevention funding with opi opioids, and then um, a $10 million capital project. So those things are kind of on the 
the um, front of um, being moved forward with Department of Health Services. The one topic that was really um, talked about quite a bit today was the fentanyl strips, and that's something that um, I'm not sure because of just coming to Dunn County in July, if that's something that's really been discussed with Dunn County, um, you know, the um, board and those types of things yet, because there's some controversy regarding the fentanyl strips that um, some counties are worried about the liability. Somebody tests, it's not accurate, something happens, right? Um, but yet, um, if we don't provide the fentanyl strips, are people dying, right? So you're kind of weighing those two risks in hand in hand. And so they said um, to make sure that county boards are really aware of that risk and that um, that you're um, having those discussions ahead of time, because if you are a county that, that is using harm reduction in the fentanyl strips and something happens, you don't want the board to you know, say, I've never heard this before, that that is a risk. Um, certainly, um, you know, anybody can be sued for anything. So that's just something that we would want to make sure that um, you're taken into account at the same time, knowing the risk that people are dying potentially if we're not doing it. So you're kind of weighing those two and what those risks are um, at this time. So um, there was that piece as well. Um, let's see here. So as far as in Dunn County itself, um, I've been kind of um, spearheading our group of department heads that have been working on this along with the chief of police from Menominee, Chief Atkinson, um, as far as looking at our priorities. We um, have put together a list of priorities. Um, I'm still waiting on one department head to get that. And then I'm um, we'll be moving forward with a meeting with them to really talk about what it is that we can use with this funding. Um, and where do we want to prioritize that? So I, I really also wanted this meeting today to get the information needed to be able to move forward. I didn't want to do something if it was going to be in conflict with what they told us today. Um, so a lot of good learning pieces as of today and moving forward. But I think we're right. Actually, we may be ahead of a lot of the counties that were there today that are just even starting the discussion. They don't have people meeting yet or any of those kinds of things. Um, so I think, you know, we are we are in a good place in Dunn County for that. So any questions for me? Paula, can I ask a quick question? And yeah. maybe we can have this conversation offline. So with the fentanyl strips, what they're sending out from the state actually is for urine. So that's a significant difficulty is that they're using it off label. And so there's some conversation from at least local health departments to say, can the state get us some interpretation on how to use these off label and that, and that, um, that guidance maybe to offset some of their concerns about liability. Sure. And, and they kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, so the gentleman from um, the Department of Health Services said, you know, of course, they can't give advice because they can't give legal advice. Right. You know, ah, we've heard that once or twice. Right. But they did say they are working on um, some handouts or um, instructions on how to use the strips. Um, that are a little more layman's term because they kind of they are really complicated and even people that have you know some higher level um, with these types of things are struggling with it and um, the testing is like opposite of like a pregnancy test or any of those kinds of things where if there's a line it actually I think means that it's a negative versus a positive and so you know people are just kind of confused with some of that so they were working on putting together some um, instructions on how to use, but they will not give legal advice from there. Thank you for that update, I appreciate it. Yep, yep, you're welcome. Any other questions for me? And so far, I think Dunn County is sitting on about $200,000, okay. right? That sounds right. Okay, two, two of the three parts of payments for the first couple of years, we have about $200,000. Mm -hmm. That's my report. Thank you. So, Sarah, knowing that it's, do you want um, Shelly to go next? Or? Yes. So, I would just say, as far as the urine review, um, the annual report of the CJCC will be full of details on all the activities that we did last year. Um, but we, we've certainly had another year um, of, of progress. So 
Yeah, I'd like to defer to Shelly Jo so we give her an opportunity to present to the group, if that's okay. I just want to make a note on the staff report section. Um, just briefly, we are looking at two additional grants. One is um, a state um, Department of Health Services um, for Vivitrol and Jail for the actual medications. And then the second grant that we're exploring um, is enhancements to Family Treatment Court and Treatment Court. It's a federal grant that's out there. So we'll keep you posted on those. Any questions from the staff report that was submitted in the packet? Okay, so I do believe there's maybe a few people here that don't know who I am, but I am Shelly Jo Metzger and I currently work inside of the jail as a substance use counselor. And um, the program actually started in, um, was it June? I think it was June of last year. Okay. Um, that's probably when we received it. Yeah. And I actually started in October of 2022. So um, there was a little bit of a delay, but thank you to those who moved this forward. And yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so what I'm currently doing is I am offering through the medication assistance treatment program inside of the jail, the uh, Vivitrol, which we're offering for free, and it is an injection that the nurse is giving um, anybody who is willing to be to volunteer to take the injection. Um, it, the injection lasts 28 days. The only thing that I've heard from the incarcerated persons is that um, their buttocks hurts and that they feel tired. So those are the only that I've heard, um, but there are some um, other symptoms that I'm sure have, um, have came up. And I do have pamphlets here on the control if anybody's interested. I am not a nurse, I am not a doctor, and I do not know everything about the control. <laughs> so do not ask me. Um, uh, the program itself is, um, going quite well. I'll go through this stuff kind of quickly. You can go to the next one. Um, so the program's going quite well. And what has been happening is that I am getting referred, basically, um, incarcerated persons who come into booking. Usually it's by the nurse. And the actual medication assisted treatment program is being explained to them. But I'm also offering, I'm also offering a uh, medication assisted treatment orientation group once a month to any incarcerated person who wants to attend it and learn more about it. Um, I can say that it has not been a bad turnout. I will say that it has actually surprised me that people willingly come to it, not just to get out of the cell, they literally listen. So there's that point of it. Then there's the point where the nurse is actually referring people to me. But um, Sandra from the CJCC office is um, doing this, those um, pre-trial assessments. She will also send me her assessments, but she will also tell me in another email saying that, these, that there's somebody that probably would be a good candidate for it. Um, so if somebody hasn't come to the group, I will meet with them individually to make sure they understand um, because I don't want them to not understand. Um, so what I usually tell them the most is that in the brain, you have the receptors, who, which this one is for the drugs. And this is literally how I do this. This is for the drugs. So if you're on opioid alcohol, you have receptors that go in and say, ooh, this feels good. But then you have these receptors over here that say, I like food, I like other things that are pleasurable to me. And so you have other receptors. And I tell them, when you get the Vivitrol injection, this Vivitrol injection blocks the feel goods. But it doesn't block the feel goods on the other things. Um, and I have to repeat that 
several times to them. Because I want them to know for those 28 days that they have that in their body, that it blocks it, and they can go out and they can drink as much as they want, and they're not gonna get the feel goods, but they're gonna feel all the icky negatives of it, falling over, being sick, being completely hung over the next day, um, possibly dying from alcohol, but more than likely dying from opioid use. Um, um, so the medication assisted treatment program, what I tell them, what I tell them is that, that there is an actual program. It's not just getting the injection that you need to meet with me to give you an assessment on my part of it because I'm actually losing my life using my licensure for this to say, you know, you are a moderate use disorder for opioids, or you are a severe use disorder for alcohol or whatever it is, but it's only opioids and it's only alcohol. And when I meet with them, I give them agreement. And the agreement, it says, you're voluntarily doing this. You are aware that you are gonna meet with me to do the assessment and so on and so on and so on. And I have um, brochures here if you guys want one that actually describes every one of them. But um, I do tell them that they have to come to one of my groups. And it can't be just one of the other AODA groups that Heather Pika puts on, they have to come to one of mine, at least one group. Because the whole point of this is to ensure that they start their recovery while they're in jail. And the progress that they do from this can move on to outpatient or residential treatment, or even at their home setting. Um, not that that would be my ideal place, but that's sometimes what it is. Um, so they are agreeing to do all these things. And I can say the turnout for this has, uh, you can go to the next slide, has been more than I thought it would be. So, um, because I know y'all are into statistics and data, um, I thought I would point out that I have offered 31 inmates medication assisted treatment program at the age of their trial injection. And let me get my other. I was more specific than I was going to get one of those. So six of those 31 were not eligible because they were methamphetamine only. And when I did talk to the Vivitrol seller provider, I don't want to say provider because provider is a doctor. Um, it is not, this is not a sub, uh, uh, injection, medication assisted treatment injection that works for methamphetamine at this time. They are in the testing of it. So it would be great if it worked. Um, I don't think I could do my job alone, Mr. Big, if it works for methamphetamine. Um, because I, I've had people ask me about it and I have to tell them that they're not eligible. Um, there are 16 incarcerated persons that took the injection. And as of right now today, there's seven of them that I am currently seeing. Um, and they are, I have to say, they're all very willing to come to my groups. They're all very willing to meet with me, even if it's for 15 minutes. I don't want to say I'm meeting with them every single week. Um, I've changed the word from basically treatment plan, which is what you do in a treatment setting, to care planning. You know, what is it that you need to progress in your recovery when you leave here? And usually it is jobs, housing, um, relationship issues. So I will work with them on whatever that is, the best I can to, to my ability. I'm not gonna give them a lot of my time because they need to do their own work, but I will give them like resources and say, I'll pull you up front or to booking and um, you know, let you use the phone if you wanna make your own phone calls. Um, so I am making sure that they do the work because I'm not going to do it for them because a lot of them try to manipulate you into doing the work. So in my opinion, I feel like this is going really well. And I know in December there was a huge fluctuation 
that totally overwhelmed me for about a week. But um, there was huge fluctuation from two, from the fifth until the nineteenth, where eleven of them were receiving the injection, and they all started within that period. And, go to the next slide. and so we have had one person return after having had the injection. Um, very interesting fellow, and he returned not very long after he had been released. Came back as a 0.32. Um, said that the injection was the reason why he drank, said he didn't drink very much. So at point three two, I'm pretty sure that he was trying to override that and couldn't feel, feel good. So um, he's never contacted me back after he was released, so I did try to follow up with him. But he's the only person that has been returned. I'm sure there'll be, there'll be more. But. Fingers crossed that there will not be more. And so as far as the actual grant itself, it is asking you to follow up with them 30 days after the release, 60 days after the release, 90 days after the release, and six months. And one of the biggest barriers to connecting with an incarcerated person after they've been released is their phone number doesn't work. Or they've given you an address where they no longer live, or they've given you a fake address. Um, so I've been asking for email addresses too. So I'll start out with a phone call. I'll move on to mailing them a survey to find out, and if they need to, I'll move on to email if they need one. So I'm trying to do what I can to get the information for the outcome that we're looking for. Um, because I know the post grant wants you know pre-information, mid-information, and what the outcomes are from anybody. Can I interrupt? Um, Shelly, just asking you a question. So, you know, the way we have it, if a person's arrested on Monday, um, Monday evening, they're seen Tuesday morning, they have their initial appearance, and you know, a lot of times you see the alcohol would be wise, would be a good candidate, but they're generally, you know, can postponed or they're released. Um, are, are they able to, to get this, or do you need someone in custody for more than, you know, 12 hours? If, if they come to me and I can connect with them, to do this, but the problem is going to be that when the process starts and they come through the door, and, and so they're not always truthful when they come to booking, saying that I've used a substance, unless they've been booked in for an OWI or whatever it is. Um, so they're not always truthful with that process. And then even when they go to the nurse, they're not always truthful either to a, a, like a full gamut of what they use. So they might say, I've used methamphetamine. But they might not say that I've used opioids. But then if they hear about the medication assisted treatment program and I meet with them, they will tell me, yeah, I have, because I'll ask them about it in the last 12 months. So if I know and I find out, I will meet with them. But the problem is going to be is that we have to contact the doctor, the jail doctor, who actually approves the injection as the overall. And if it's on a Friday, he doesn't work on Fridays. Um, and we don't like to do it on a Friday anyway because there's no follow through to make sure that they're not having reactions from the injection. But they're coming in on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're good. And if we can catch them early enough when they come in, yes. Yeah. So it, it is. But they also can be under the influence of anything. So the alcohol, they can be, but the opioids they have to have been. Off of it for like seven to ten days. Yeah. So if they are not off of it, which I'm guessing many are not, and they're released, can they come back, or do you have to be in custody when you get the injection? It's for in jail only. But I do. So like currently, I have someone who wants it, but he doesn't want to take it while he's in the jail setting because he does have a lot of medical issues. And he does want to talk to his own physician, which I completely understand with his medical condition. I understand that. So he is aware that he can get this on his own or from his provider. Um, we do have providers that we work with here in Dunn County. They're very minimal, and that is a huge barrier. Um, I have two from Mayo. And they don't just say, okay, come in for the injection and that's it. But I want to meet with you face to face. 
So, and that's really the overall of this is that they, you want to make sure that they're going to follow through with being in recovery instead of just getting an injection. So we do have two providers here. One is Dr. Spencer and one is Dr. Wigger. And they both do meet with them. Um, the problem is that a lot of physicians don't want to deal with substance use issues. So I will refer them to their second shot. But if they can't get it while they're in jail, like this gentleman, I will, I will help him to his best ability to find somebody that he can go to. And he does know and I did make him aware. Does that mean he'll take it? I don't know. That's a good question. Those are all good questions. Any other questions? The postdoc grant ends in September of 2023. And it's unsure about a renewal at this point. We don't really know. Well, I'm confident in talking with the people from the state that are the extent. Yeah. Um, I spent two hours yesterday with the dad person. And she mentioned that there's some issues going on in Kenosha. So it just, Validates the fact that it does need to continue, according to what she presented to me. So, so um, we just um, concluded uh, grant reporting for this latest quarter. We spent over $25,000 on the medication assisted treatment already, um, which is great that we're um, able to buy the medications and we have um, individuals that are interested. But it just shows you how, you know, a $150,000 grant sounds like a lot, but it can go quite quickly. So that's why we're also looking at this additional grant funding for, it is specific for Vivitrol in the jail setting. Um, so if we have a need for more, we'll probably put in a, a grant to make sure that we have the medication for anybody that wants it. $1,200 a shot. That's right. Yeah. And it and, does bring up a good point too, because since we started late, you know, we've been offering anybody the injection. So really the actual grant wants you to offer to them prior to their release. Not as in you're gonna be in jail for six months. So you're gonna be in jail for 30 days. Okay, then we're gonna give it to you. So we we have been giving it to more people than basically the grant really just says that you um, need to give it to them because they're supposed to be being released soon. Um, Cause like right now I have like three people that may be here until like the early summer of this year. Um, but I haven't had any really huge negative feedback about the whole program to be completely honest with you. And for the most part, um, I haven't had any real negative feedback on the um, evidence-based uh, classes, groups um, that I'm giving in jail to those who want it, but the people that are in the medication assisted treatment program get precedence over the other incarcerated persons. Um, so um, I offered Living in Balance, which is an evidence-based program, and then I'm currently um, finishing up criminal and addictive thinking. Um, and for the most part, I'm really surprised at the criminal and addictive thinking that what they're sharing is very relevant to what we're discussing. So, yeah, I feel like it's going well. Great. Thanks for coming, Shelly. Yeah, you're welcome. Great for the conducting on that. And I think that's what part of one of our goals for 2023. So, we'll probably talk to you more about it. Um, so, looks like our next meeting dates February um, 1st for operations. Um, March 1st for executive, and then our large meeting will be April 13th at 4 p.m. Any motion to adjourn? So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everybody.